Hello, welcome back um, to the chat. Hello, everyone who showed up for the lecture tonight and to the YouTubers out there who are watching this later. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we're the, the main plan for tonight's video lecture is going to be to uh, get started on this ethical theory stuff in earnest. We've done a lot of preparation stuff from last week um, and sort of setting the stage on stuff. Um, but now we're going to be diving into some of the nuts and bolts of these big three sometimes get referred to as the big three uh, ethical theories in Western philosophy. And these are not, um, this, is, this isn't uh, exhaustive of all the options that are out there. Um, but the big three are the big three for a reason. Um, they cover a lot of the ground of how you could approach designing a moral theory in a lot of different ways, which I'll actually be talking about here in a second. But um, before we get started on that, just diving right into that, I did want to say a couple words about the journals. Uh, a few of you have been asking me about them. I sent out an announcement earlier today uh, sort of clarifying the instructions for them. I think the best policy for us moving forward is, is just to think about the instructions as requiring 500 words minimum. And whatever way you want to format that or you know, double space, single space, fonts, size, any of that stuff, you can do whatever you want. Uh, I'm not really concerned about uh, what formatting you use. Um, but if I'm getting 500 words, then that's great. So uh, the original instructions on the syllabus said one to two pages, and that's kind of in the ballpark of uh, 500 words if you're using standard formatting, one-inch margins, double-spaced, 12-point font, Times New Roman, that kind of thing. Um, but let's just stick to 500 words as the um, parameters for it. In terms of the rest of it, um, the, the more content-based instructions for the assignment, um, I just want to kind of highlight again what I'm looking for. The purpose of the assignment is as a reflection for you to process the stuff that we're doing in this class. Especially, I think it's important given um, how we don't have as much face-to-face -face time um, where you can ask questions and, and we can kind of talk things over together and process it. Um, but even if this was a face-to-face -face class in a classroom, I still do the journal assignments because I think it's good for you to, to think about stuff for yourself to kind of on your own. I mentioned before that uh, philosophy is kind of sometimes a little different field because we're not saying like wait, study, 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 and then once you have a certain amount of exposure or experience, now you can have an opinion or something or have some authority to speak from. In philosophy, it's like, what do you think? Like right away, right from the beginning. Um, so being a student of philosophy, I really think shouldn't be approached as a purely scholastic sort of thing. But you want to get practice as early as possible um, in stepping into the game. And since, you know, in this context, business ethics, um, there's a chance that this might be the only philosophy class that you take, then all the more reason why I want you to get into the game and, and start doing it for yourself. Definitely the paper project that's happening at the end of the quarter uh, is going to require you to do this. So the journals are kind of like a little bit of practice, too. Um, I don't want you to write them in a very formal academic style. They're not an essay. Um, they're not a paper paper. Uh, they can be written very informally in what, whatever style you want to um, because I really am thinking of them more as, as kind of reflections for you. But even if you're, you're not writing them in a formal style, they're going to get you really good practice for the formal paper you have to write later because really I'm going to be grading those and, look, and evaluating them not based so much on paper craft or English writing skills and stuff like that. Definitely not spelling and grammar. Um, I'm more concerned with your ideas and your thinking. And even if you're writing in kind of an informal way, you're having to think through ideas, how you evaluate them, how you would justify that, and maybe even potentially thinking about possible objections and what your opponents might say. And that's really what I want you to do in the journals. So in the instructions, I describe them as um, first, just pick one idea. Don't do everything from the week, uh, but just pick one sort of theme uh, or concept or claim or uh, argument that was discussed that came up in the life of the class from the previous week. I do want them to be kind of reflections at the end of the week rather than things you're doing beforehand. Um, after we've had the chance to kind of talk about things through these lectures, uh, and process together a little bit uh, what's going on with, with uh, these readings and these theories. Um, so pick just one thing so you can get into some kind of depth about it. If you try to summarize the whole week, 
that's you're not going to be able to do almost anything with that in 500 words. So don't do that. I really want you to focus on just one thing. In the first part of the journal, explain that idea. Imagine that you're kind of giving that description to someone who's not in the class, uh, who isn't following what's going on, hasn't done these readings, hasn't heard any of what we've been talking about. Uh, as if you're kind of like trying to catch them up to speed on this idea that you have something to say about. So you have to kind of be like setting the stage a little bit. That's really good practice for the research paper because uh, you'll have to explain the ideas of other people as a part of bringing in these sources to your discussion. Um, and then in the second half to two thirds, definitely not less than a half of the journal should be devoted to your sort of ideas about that idea and um, how you evaluate it, what you think of it, what's your analysis of it, uh, kind of your two cents. And as much as possible, I think that if the journal is going to really serve you as preparation for the paper, try to back up your opinion. Don't just describe your perspective. Don't just throw your two cents in there, but try to justify it. Try to explain the logic and reasoning that you have behind why you're taking the stance that you're taking on that idea. And, uh, and then maybe even, for even bonus points here, uh, metaphorical bonus points, um, try to uh, anticipate possible objections. Kind of like um, on the Code of Intellectual Conduct, charity and rebuttal. Try, try to integrate that. Um, engaging with your opponent uh, and taking their concerns seriously and then responding to them is one of the big things that I'm always looking uh, for for my students for philosophy papers. It's an essential part of doing good philosophical work. You can't just build your little castle in the sky by yourself, not engaging with anybody else or thinking about possible criticism. Um, uh, being sensitive to how someone might not agree with you, how they might put up a fight uh, challenging your claims, and, and trying to respect their concerns, whether you think they're legitimate, sort of granting which points you think um, are correct and should be respected in whatever answer we provide but also even those things that you might think are illegitimate. So if there are concerns that you can imagine people having that look like really good arguments or rational concerns, and you can show why they um, maybe are not as good as they initially appear, that's a great kind of rebuttal too. Um, so so those, that's a, a little uh, recap of, of the vision I have for these things. Um, I think one of the most difficult things about these journals is that I don't give you a really explicit prompt for what to write about. So you kind of have to decide. But that's also going to serve you as really good practice for the paper too. Because the paper is not going to, it's like business ethics. Go. Oh. <laughs> it's not going to be like, here's a list of topics you could write on. And I don't necessarily want you writing on something that we're studying in the class too. You could. Um, but you could also do something totally different as well. So um, part, of, part of what makes philosophy difficult is kind of you have to decide what do you think matters to talk about? What do you think we should be talking about? What should be uh, on our radar? Uh, what should we be concerned about? Um, so the journals in their kind of open-endedness I think will serve you well um, for picking up that skill as well. That's that's another part of the landscape of, of doing philosophy. Um, does anyone in the chat have any questions about the journals um, that I what I've just been discussing didn't, didn't uh, resolve or didn't address? Are there any any kind of uh, questions about what you want to be doing or how to attack it? It's like maybe a no. Okay, cool. Certainly, for those of you who are watching on YouTube later here too, uh, please feel free to reach out and talk to me. Even even if you got a pretty good idea of what I'm asking for, um, you might still struggle with like figuring out what to talk about from week to week. And I'm I mean I'm happy to talk with students about everything. Even if you just like want someone to kind of kick around some ideas to see if you can get a direction or help you brainstorm something, I'm happy to do that too. So. Uh, I, I wanted to say again to everyone through the video lectures uh, how uh, I do give you my phone number intentionally and with the purpose of using it. So um, if you want to talk things over, 
um, process things more, uh, if you have any questions about what's going on with the class, um, I'm, I've got time every day of the week uh, to talk to you. Um, I'm not always free, I've got other classes and stuff like that going on, but um, feel free to send me text messages, call me up. I definitely have, always have students who are like, that's kind of weird, I'm not used to like calling my professor or texting with them or something. Um, but this is something I like to do. Uh, I like to be as accessible as I possibly can, especially for my online students, because we don't get the chance to, to interact on a, on a daily sort of basis, or a week, even a weekly sort of basis oftentimes. So um, don't be shy. Okay. Um, thank you, chat, for, for letting me know what's going on for you. Um, feel free to jump in at any time again. It's always free for you to ask questions. I've got the little chat bar up on the side of my screen here. So I'll be able to see if you've got something going on. Again, I kind of like the convention of if you've, if you've got like a bigger thing you want to ask about. Um, so before I like keep rolling into something else in my lecture, just like type something in like, hey, I got something or I have a question, something like that. And then I'll know to like pause and wait and I'll wait for you to kind of type out your, your uh, whatever you have to say uh, and then I'll respond to it. Um, you can also feel free if you've got a microphone, you want to just jump in with the mic, uh, that's okay too. Okay, um, so we're going to start um, of these big three. We're going to start with mill and utilitarianism, but I do have a, I have a few more words um, about how to go into this unit uh, and things I kind of encourage for like being a student of this stuff. Um, the first one I was mentioning a, a couple minutes ago. Uh, these big three are big three for a reason in the sense that they cover a lot of the possible ground of how you could approach constructing a moral theory. There are moral theories for days. There are so many different, um, there's a, so much diversity in terms of what we care about, what we value, what lifestyles we think are appropriate, all sorts of stuff. In the details, <clears throat> the complexity is overwhelming. Um, you can especially see it by just looking at uh, the diversity of culture that we have on this planet. Cultures are largely defined by their ethical perspectives of what kind of ideal or model for living that they're sort of encouraging within their communities, um, what they value, what they find meaningful, all that kind of stuff. But when it comes down to the theoretical basis for all those different particular choices of values, um, there's not maybe as much diversity as you might expect. And it gets even um, more narrow when we start thinking about um, the different possible ways of justifying a moral theory sort of taken in the abstract. I remember when I was, I, I am an ethicist by trade, that's my main specialization. And this question about justification has been probably the most um, dominating philosophical question about ethics for my own thinking and my own research and work. Um, I'm really, really concerned about how can we sort of make some progress here on figuring out of all the options, what should we do? Like, which one should we pick? Um, sort of how to discriminate between all these different possible lives that we could be living um, without begging the question, without uh, having that decision basically just be made on arbitrary grounds, like through bias. Um, how, are, how can we have a debate about this? How can we engage in some kind of moral reasoning that isn't unduly favoring some of these positions initially, like that there's um, the the terms of the debate are not being set up uh, in in sort of equal kind of way, an egalitarian sort of way, given all the sort of options of what we could be doing. And that's a major, major problem that all of these philosophers are discussing too. They're very much aware of this um, and uh, and trying to be responsive to it. But I'm actually, sorry, it's after 8 o'clock. This is going to happen. I'm mixing up two things I wanted to talk about. So let me slow it down here. Okay, so first first thought. Um, while I was in grad school, and I was focused on this question about justification, at one point I, I decided, I was like, I'm just going to make a list. Like, I've uh, read a lot of different philosophers. I've uh, been very interested in, in um, cultural studies across the globe, um, different religious traditions, just thinking about all the different ways that I've heard people uh, make argument to defend a moral or ethical perspective. What are sort of the basic options, the basic sources of appeal that we could point at to try to justify one of these positions? 
and I made the list, and I was kind of surprised at how short it was. That they're um, with all this diversity of ethical perspectives, that they're that there's only so many options that we've got to pick from in a sort of setting the foundation and the, and the basic general approach. So there's a there's a metaphor I really like, and I, I think I might have used it before in one of these lectures. Um, a moral theory is like a map. Of, re of reality, just the moral reality. So it, let's say I'm a cartographer and I'm trying to make a map of a geographical region, so topography. So there's the actual landscape that's out there, and then I'm drawing a picture of it, right? And my, my picture and my map doesn't cover all the details, but I'm, I'm trying to hit the big landmarks um, to figure out how to navigate that space, right? I want to use a map to navigate a topography. Um, and the moral theory is like the map. It's an intellectual object, that, but it's trying to represent uh, a different sort of reality. So ethics is not just about our thoughts, but it's trying to like capture. The thoughts are trying to capture something. They're trying to point at or reference uh, these moral realities, these moral phenomena. Um, and so I like to talk about this moral landscape. So there's this kind of... Uh, moral realities that we're trying to respect and be sensitive to as we're designing a theory that's going to give us guidance for how to navigate life. So I, I really like that metaphor for thinking about what it means to participate in ethical theory and to theorize about ethics. It's ultimately not about the theory for the theory's sake. The theory is just a guide for how to live the uh, a life that's respecting these um, ethical realities. And the big three sort of, you might say, cover big swaths of the moral landscape. And depending on your point of view and kind of which of these arguments you might find more convincing or less convincing, you might think one of these theories uh, really gets a much more accurate picture of that moral topography than the other ones do. But one of my pieces of advice going into this whole section is that um, I think trying listening for like which one am I a fan of is maybe not the best approach I think a more nuanced approach is, is uh, appropriate and um, that each of these theories uh, even if you like strongly disagree with it has something to offer here probably there's probably something about the moral landscape that it's being sensitive to that we ought to be sensitive to even if you think there's some big moral blind spots in other parts or the way that they get the relative priority of some of these things is is out of whack, uh, or maybe you don't um, agree with the way that the theory is attempting to justify itself. There's a lot of options for disagreement here, for sure. Um, but I think all of these theories uh, have kind of this uh, perennial relevance to the ethics that people uh, do throughout history because they are capturing some of the big picture stuff. Just as a per personal anecdotal story, I used to hate utilitarianism. I thought utilitarianism was garbage. Um, in my notes here, I, I say early on that it's it's a very controversial moral theory, that some people think it's the salvation of progressive thinking, whereas other people think of it as a monstrous distortion of morality. And I used to think of it as a monstrous distortion of reality. In fact, those words I use in the lecture are actual words that I used to use to describe my attitude about utilitarianism. Um, but then I started teaching it. That was one thing. I started teaching ethics classes, and I was like, well, we got to talk about utilitarianism. And as a teacher, you're like, you're not just going to present some material and just throw it right under the bus, but you're, you know, you're trying to help your students understand, like, why do people find this thing compelling? Why is it one of the options that is sort of perennially on the table? And, and so I, I'm charitably presenting utilitarianism. I'm like, oh, maybe there's some good things in here. Like, I didn't, I've got students objecting to the theory and, and presenting challenges, and I'm like, oh, you know, Mill actually probably has an answer to your objection there. I was like, maybe this thing is a little bit better than I thought. And then as I was working on my own ethical theories and running into certain problems, I started to find uh, occasionally, not always, I still don't really ag agree with util. I'm not a utilitarian. Uh, just, you know, letting you know, cards on the table. Um, but when I started working on my own moral theory, I started to be like, ooh, this is a problem. What am I going to do about this? Oh, you know, utilitarianism is kind of the perfect little thing to deal with that issue. And I'm, I'm kind of surprised with how much of uh, utilitarianism sort of crept in small ways into my own moral theory. 
So I think um, instead of kind of all or nothing thinking about these theories, and or just which one are you more of a fan of, I think it's good to look at them with this critical eye of, okay, what do I think this theory is getting right? What is it uh, respecting or shining attention on that does seem to legitimately be a part of the moral landscape, part of moral phenomenon, worth respecting? And then which parts is it kind of not getting accurate? Um, are there some things here that I'm concerned about? And you can really take little pieces from all over the place and kind of put them together. I mean, my just as an example, my own moral theory is not um, really just in lockstep with any of these theories. It's kind of its own thing. But I definitely have learned a lot from studying these theories, and, and they've opened my eyes to some things of moral concern that I wasn't tracking before I, I studied them. And that's kind of why we're doing it in this class. We're, we're talking about these theories because I think they give us a, a better idea of what are even the possible things that might be on our moral radar when we're looking at the business world or particular situations or settings within that. Uh, what could be of moral concern here? These series will help give us some more to be sensitive to, even if you disagree with them. You know, it's, at least now maybe you understand where your opponents are coming from and what might be motivating them. Okay, so um, that's some advice I have going into this. Um, my other, the other idea that was hanging on there um, when I was talking before about this, these issues of justification, about how do you uh, defend rationally um, any of these choices about what moral perspective to adopt, um, that's a really big problem, and it needs to be respected in for its magnitude. Um, jumping the gun on answers to moral questions, treating things as more simple and direct than they actually are. I think that's a real distinct danger with ethics. Um, I think generally our, our moral re reasoning and moral reflections are uh, fairly thin. Um, we seem to devote more critical attention to our understanding of descriptive claims about reality than the normative claims. At least that's true in my experience. That's what I've observed. Um, we have a greater tendency to take for granted our fundamental uh, moral principles and values rather than other things. Uh, we're definitely really sensitive to moral disagreement, but not necessarily in a way that motivates us to do a better job making a case or defending through argument why we're making the moral choices we are. Oftentimes we do just rely on intuition or conscience um, or uh, or just say like, if you don't agree with this, then like, what's wrong with you kind of thing. Um, so I, I think it is important to respect that question, and there, I, I was, um, you know, the risk of bias is pretty high when it comes to moral matters. Uh, the ways in which uh, other for, irrational and irrational psychological forces, or political or sociological forces, cultural forces, can sort of hijack our belief-forming processes when it comes to moral matters. Definitely, the danger is high, um, and a lot of those mistakes involve taking something that's sort of contingent about me and my experience or my feelings or my thinking and projecting it out on everybody as if it's a universal thing when it isn't. And all the philosophers we're about to study, they're doing a really ambitious thing. They're trying to say, here's the foundation for all moral judgments. It's universal. It's objective, it applies to all people in all times and places, no matter what. No matter the culture, background, experience. This is a master framework for understanding everything that has to do with good and bad and right and wrong and all this kind of stuff, meaning in life. Um, that's a pretty audacious project to engage in, as I think I might have mentioned before. I mean, that's just like, what? It's so ambitious. Um, but none of these philosophers take uh, the project lightly, I think. That's definitely my sense of them. And maybe I'm wrong about this stuff. I mean, I didn't know John Stuart Mill personally. He died a very, very long time ago. But when I'm reading their works, the amount of care and sensitivity to competing perspectives and how much they attempt, at least, whether you, whether you think their arguments are successful or not, their attempt to shoulder their burden of proof here 
tells me that they're pretty sincere in respecting the gravity of what they're up to. Uh, but they think it must, it, it, so you got to do it. You got to take a shot at it and try to make those choices um, as intentional and as accountable as you possibly can. Um, the idea of kind of being like, nah, I'm just not going to make any claims at all. Well, you're going to live your life. You're going to make choices. And the question is, do you want to hold those choices accountable or not? Do you want to take that responsibility, shoulder that burden of proof or not? Um, and uh, I kind of agree with them in, in thinking that, yeah, you, you have to. You have to look at this stuff. Otherwise, you're just saying, like, why do, why do I value these things? Meh. I like them. Yeah, it's just me. And it doesn't take seriously the freedom that you have in thinking about, you know, like, I could be living all those other ways, too. Why am I picking this one? Just out of, like, habit or laziness. And that, I mean, respecting people's choices here, absolutely. Like, people have freedom to... I think it is an objective moral value to allow people to make choices about how they want to live their life. We're not talking about if you agree with a moral theory about objective moral truths or something that you're buying into a totalitarian state of repression where people don't have free will or agency. That's not the case. Um, people need agency in order to make wrong choices, as one of my favorite uh, existentialist Viktor Frankl says. He says it's, it's the prerogative of human beings to become guilty to have the opportunity of getting things wrong. Um, but you got choices to make here, and the the stakes are can be pretty high. Um, moral mistakes aren't minor things. Like if I've got some wacky theory of time in philosophy, like in metaphysics or something, I've got some theory of time, turns out to be inaccurate, you know, not a lot of danger there. There's not a lot of risk. Bernard Williams says, uh, at one point in his writings, he's got a book for undergrads on morality. He says, um, uh, one ought to treat um, writing on moral philosophy as something dangerous, um, not just because writing on anything is dangerous or writing on something philosophical or controversial, but for two special reasons. He says, one, um, when you're writing on morality, you have a greater chance of uh, being shown the fool, basically. Like, you're kind of bearing your chest to everyone. You're like, here's all my dirty laundry, right? You're like, here's here's what I find meaningful in life. Here's what I value. These are my priorities. Um, so it's a, it's a little more vulnerable to, to write on moral matters. But also, uh, he says, it should also be taken as uh, something dangerous because one runs the, the risk, if one is taken seriously, of misleading people on matters of great importance. And I think that's a nice little way to kind of put the stakes here. Um, especially when we're talking about the business world. Uh, as I say in the syllabus, the world of business has a massive potential for affecting people's lives for better and for worse. And so how that happens, how do we go about that, what kind of world are we creating um, through how we're building the economic facet of, of our world, that's a pretty serious matter. Um, so I think part of studying ethics is just a matter of respecting the seriousness of it giving it your best shot, um, being modest about that. And I, I think these philosophers are modest too. Sometimes their rhetoric can be a little off-putting. If you haven't read philosophy before, they're kind of just like, this is absolutely true, and here's the reason why it's true. But they're not speaking with authority. They're not thinking that their say-so is somehow matters more than other people's say-so or something like that. They really are thinking about it in terms of the, the legitimacy of their positions depends on the power of their arguments, the ideas themselves, not the fact that they're the ones saying it. It's not about their say-so. And they recognize that there are competing perspectives out there, and that philosophy is bigger than one person and their efforts. And there's going to be discussion about it. It's not just going to be like they write their magnum opus and that settles it for all time. Um, so the process of objective truth-seeking here uh, in morality is the same as with all other topics. This is a process we work on together um, as an entire human race, and if we ever meet or discover sentient non-human aliens uh, or animals, then they'll be a part of that process too. Actually, more on that when we get to Kant. Kant's got some interesting things to say about aliens and uh, non-human animals. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So that's all the really big stuff I wanted to say, um, kind of getting into this. At this point, maybe I'll check in with the, um, the chat here. Is anyone having any questions? Anything popped up along the way here?
Oke. Okay. Cool. I love the responses. Thank you. Thank you, people who are responding in the chat. Helps me feel like I'm not alone. Just talking to myself on this screen. Okay, I'll keep going here. So now let's get into Mill. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about utilitarianism first. It's gonna be the first ethical theory we're gonna go after. Um, I am trying to keep these kind of as a crash course, so I'm, there's a lot of things to talk about. Uh, I'm going to try to put it in a compact space here, so especially those of you who are in the chat, let me know if, if I'm talking about stuff and it's not making sense, because if it's not making sense for you, it probably isn't going to make sense for some people on YouTube later too. So you're kind of my uh, my canary in the coal mine, sort of, so if, let me know how, how things are going. Um, the other thing, uh, oh yeah. Dang it, there's another thing. There's so many things to say. Um, one of my, even with this kind of abbreviated crash course version, I'm really sensitive about um, giving you a description of these theories that's too cartoonish or simplified or reduced or something like that. Um, I think even professional philosophers, usually the ones who aren't ethicists, who are specialized in some other area of philosophy, have a lot of misconceptions about what Kant, Mill, and Aristotle are standing for and how they argue for it especially. Um, so if you go and watch on YouTube like utilitarianism, like five minute presentation of utilitarianism or something, oftentimes there's a lot of misconceptions that are that are um, being presented there. A lot of um, usually straw man versions of these positions um, when they really, they're really robust. I mean these positions are are hard to criticize. It's easy to maybe find where there's controversial elements but to actually uh, resolve those controversies can be very, very difficult. Um, the theories are very much worked out, and they have a lot of resources to work on. Definitely don't be intimidated by it. I mean, try to go after them. If, if something smells fishy to you, explore that. Think about it. Think about what is my concern about this, and can that concern be resolved or responded to by, by this theory or, or not, or not. Uh, maybe something has to give there. Um, and uh, utilitarianism is no exception to this. Uh, utilitarianism gets misunderstood a lot. Um, many times it gets turned into a straw man, um, even by people who should know better, like professional philosophers. So <clears throat> I'm going to try to give you a, a really uh, detailed picture of what's going on here. Like I've mentioned in, in I think, my weekend update email, um, I want you to come away with an understanding of what the theory is proposing, like what is its vision, for a moral life and how you ought to make choices about what to do. But maybe even more importantly, I hope you come away with it with an understanding of why each of these philosophers has the position that they do. So in some ways, their different styles of arguing and attempting to justify their theory is maybe the more interesting thing here. Because um, uh, that, that might give you some ideas of other directions that you could go for how you would want to defend your, your theory or your perspective on morality. Okay, <clears throat> um, first thing to say about Mill and utilitarianism is that it's not uh, invented by Mill. In fact, Mill thinks that really the basic idea of utilitarianism has been around all the way back, going back to Plato and Socrates. It's been around for a long time. Um, the, at this time in history, though, uh, in, well, the 18th century, uh, Jeremy Bentham is developing uh, a, a more modern version of utilitarianism. It's very motivated by what's going on with the scientific revolution and how uh, applied mathematics is transforming our understanding of the natural world and really paving the way for what we would recognize as scientific reasoning and the scientific method and all this kind of empirical method of research and um, discovering the laws of the universe. In the early modern period, in the scientific revolution in the 17th, 18th century, um, there's a few philosophers who connect the dots on algebra and geometry. That you can represent geometrical truths using algebra. Um, you're probably familiar with the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. We've known about the Pythagorean theorem, this geometrical relationship, all the way back from ancient Greece. Like Pythagoras is around in the days of Socrates but they didn't understand it as a squared plus b squared equals c squared. They had another way of doing geometrical proofs to show these relationships logically. 
is, it actually looks like a logical proof, axiomatic reasoning. Sometimes it's kind of gone out of style, but um, sometimes uh, middle school geometry classes would introduce students to doing axiomatic proofs for geometrical relationships. Uh, that's kind of fallen out of favor. I, I've noticed a lot of my students haven't done that anymore. And, and they mostly just learned the algebra version. But this was crazy because uh, once you can use algebra to represent geometry, you can start using math to do physics. And that's pretty mind-blowing for everyone around this time period. And it really it allows Newton to exist. You don't have Newton without calculus, and calculus is really a big part of this. Um, and it was philosophers who kind of put this stuff together. I mean, but prior to this, there wasn't really a distinction between scientists and philosophers. But, but anyway, I make, I'm getting onto a rambly lecture here. The main point is this. Because of that big, mind-blowing moment about math, uh, people started to get enthusiastic about solving other problems using math. So, like, if math can transform physics and just skyrocket our progress here on understanding the world, maybe we can use it to solve other things, like ethics maybe ethics maybe math can be used for ethics too there could be a calculus for ethics and that's what jeremy bentham's basic inspiration is and uh he starts um he coins this idea of utilitarianism he starts doing this um sort of calculus based version of ethics um mill's father is a big fan and thinks that this is kind of like the the modern secular ethical gospel that this is what's going to transform the world and make it a better place um, there's a lot of progressive ideals that are a part of utilitarianism and john stuart mill um, who we're mostly going to be studying his version of utilitarianism he is definitely no exception to that um, he is a extremely progressive voice in his own time he, he's one of those philosophers that doesn't just sit in their ivory tower and write books and stuff but is really involved in human affairs and human society um, uh, John Stuart Mill's in the 19th century, served in Parliament um, in Britain. Uh, he was totally opposed to slavery, arguing against that, that should be illegal. He fought for women's suffrage, uh, the, the right of women to vote, uh, and really encouraged a whole lot of land reform for people that are working the land to own it or have rights protected in some sort of way. Um, and he thought of all these kind of progressive uh, ideas as falling out from uh, these core uh, utilitarian axioms of ethics. Um, so we'll talk about we'll talk about the deep egalitarianism that's a part of utilitarianism. But but Mill is definitely uh, someone who put his uh, money where his mouth was. But anyway, his father like gave him this intense training program, um, trying to groom him to be this superhuman academic person who could spread utilitarianism to the rest of the world. Could like make the case for it publicly. And argue for it, and um, and Mill was doing everything right, and then he has uh, in accordance with what his father wanted, um, and I mean he was kind of a boy genius sort of person, and then he has a massive mental breakdown at when he's 20, as you might imagine, um, huge existential crisis about like what is he doing with his life, what does he want to do, does he is he going to follow this kind of path that's been prepared for him by his by his father. Um, he ends up um, going through with it, and I think that's kind of interesting. You could say that maybe he was brainwashed into utilitarianism, but man, when I look at his writing and when I, and knowing a little bit about his bi biography, um, I, I, I think he's pretty sincere. I think uh, the sincerity by which he's like, yeah, these ideas are real good, is why he does end up choosing to follow this path that... Uh, he didn't really set for himself that his father set up for him. Um, I don't. I don't think it was out of like obedience to his father or anything like that. Um, Mill is a very uh, self-driven, self-motivated, empowered sort of person. Um, but uh, but yeah. I, so I think he's sincere about all this stuff. Um, but he does end up doing exactly what his father was hoping he would, and sort of spreading this idea. But the main point here is. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Bentham's version of utilitarianism to get started, but we're, we want to quickly move into Mill's version because it's it's just way superior to Bentham's. Bentham's is a little rough around the edges, um, open to a lot of objections, and really it's the objections against Bentham's utilitarianism, his version of utilitarianism, 
that motivates a lot of the changes that Mill makes to the formula. And the reason why we're studying it is because Mill's basic uh, reimagining of utilitarianism, his kind of retooling of it, has really stood the test of time. Modern utilitarians are very, very similar to how Mill goes about doing this, and, and Mill really frames a lot of discussions about how modern utilitarianism should go. Um, in fact, uh, one of the most common things you'll see in of contemporary utilitarians is they'll talk about utility in terms of this idea of preference satisfaction, and even though Mill doesn't talk about that, they always credit him with it, because the changes that he's making to the formula seem to be moving in this direction. And that, that kind of version of utilitarianism has been able to withstand argument and objection a, a lot better than a lot of other versions. So there are updates to it. There's still people who are continuing to try to retool it, um, but Mill set a really solid platform for this. So we'll use his version as kind of a, um, uh, a representative of this, this theory, utilitarianism. And that's the next thing I wanted to talk about in the lecture. Um, when we talk about utilitarianism, ism, we're really talking about kind of a family of theories. There's a lot of diversity within here. There's a lot of like little tweaks and adjustments about how you want to do things. Um, but there's definitely some broad patterns here. It's kind of like a religious tradition, like I was talking about Buddhism before we got started here. Um, Buddhism has all sorts of different traditions and movements and schools of thought within it. But there are some basic things that if, like, if you're a Buddhist, you're buying into. And that's kind of like these, these categories of isms in moral theory and in philosophy generally. Um, there's some things that utilitarians are going to collectively endorse. They might disagree and quibble about some of the details. And those details might matter a lot. Uh, but they all kind of have the same general pattern of how they're approaching things. Um, and actually, when it comes to utilitarianism, to get started on explaining what it is and what it stands for, we actually have to talk about another ism first. And that's consequentialism. So utilitarianism is a species of consequentialism. For all those of you in the chat, uh, I am going to be pulling up my lecture notes from time to time here on the video for the YouTubers. Um, and if you want to kind of follow along here, I'm going to be um, working on lecture one here about uh, halfway down the first page. Uh, I start talking about consequentialism. So if you kind of want to follow along with my notes, you, you can do that. Uh, but those of you who watch on YouTube should be popping up on your screen. So let's take a look here. So consequentialism I have listed in my notes as defined as a kind of ethical theory that has the, a basic commitment to this idea that actions are justified by their effects alone. And I summarize this parenthetically as right derives from good. So let's talk about this. If we're a consequentialist, if we if we have a consequentialist way of thinking about ethics, then we're thinking that how you're going to determine what's the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do, like how to make choices in life, will come will be a, a function, if you will, of first figuring out what's good and bad, and then doing the actions that create good things and avoid creating bad things. So that's why it's called consequentialism. That basically the consequences of an action are the, the things that are morally significant about that action. That's how we're going to measure whether it's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. And that might sound a little basic to you. I mean, that might you might be like, isn't that all of ethics? <laughs> and the only things that we disagree about are what are the things that are good and bad. But actually there are some other ways to think about choices of right and wrong. Um, and we'll see them with Kant and Aristotle. They also they definitely think about this in a slightly different model. Um, there are other factors that might influence where we think those fences are, those lines are drawn of like things you can't do. Um, let, let, I'll just do a quick thing because we're gonna we're gonna talk about them soon with with Kant and Aristotle coming fast here. Um, so you'll be able to see a lot of the contrast. But just to give you a little picture of it right now, um, if you have some moral intuitions that tell you some actions are just wrong. They're not allowable. Like if you believe in human rights, for example, a lot of the idea of basic human rights, or there's like, there's some things that are just wrong. And they're still wrong, even if they create more good than harm, or they have all this sort of benefit that could come out of them, they're still wrong. Um, one really classic example for this that gets debated a lot today uh, is torture. 
So think think not all torture, but under certain circumstances, maybe torturing someone could produce some positive benefit. So there's like this classic scenario, they call it the ticking time bomb terrorist example uh, in, in moral philosophy, um, where you've got, you know that there's a weapon of mass destruction in the city somewhere, a terrorist planted it, you found the terrorist, you don't know where the bomb is, you don't know how to defuse it, terrorist isn't going to tell you, um, but the thought might be, if we torture this person, we'll get the information we need to save millions of lives or something like that, right? Thousands of lives, maybe. Um, so, does that justify it? Right? If we can create all this good, is it so wrong for us to do that? And there's a lot of people in moral philosophy that think, nah, torture, torture is just out of bounds, can't be considered, not an option, no matter what. doesn't matter how much good it'll create. This is a matter of basic human dignity, and that's sinking too low. Um, that there are some actions that are just off limits. It doesn't matter if they create more good and harm, or it's for the greater good, or something like that. Um, now, you might disagree with those perspectives, you, but that also might mean that you're a consequentialist. Like, there's other patterns of moral thinking here. But this is one of those kind of basic choices that you have to make when you're constructing and crafting a, a moral perspective. Um, do I think... The question of consequentialism, if I agree with it or not, is do I think all there is to right and wrong is just a matter of which actions make for the best consequences? Or not? Is, it, is that the way that ethics works, or doesn't it? And the consequentialist is going to go that route with it. So um, other moral theories are going to try to derive the oughts of right and wrong from something other than the consequences, something other than just the things that are good or bad. But the way consequentialism is going to work, good and bad, figure that out first, and then right and wrong is kind of trivial from there. Just figuring out which actions are, are going to create those consequences and which ones won't. Any questions so far in the chat? Ah, yes. Um, so naturalistic systems. Um, uh, there are a lot of uh, moral theories that were floating around uh, in the history of Western philosophy and at Eastern philosophy, to be honest, um, for a very long time were these kind of naturalistic ethics. And the basic idea is that the right way for humans to live is mirrored off of some kind of natural order of things or natural harmony to existence, something like that. So... Um, you, you look, kind of took a look at the natural world and tried to emulate what you see going on there in society. Um, that's the right way to live. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can go with this, but like, let's take a really simple example here. Uh, Stoicism is a very interesting ancient ethic uh, for a lot of reasons, but one of its components is if you're, it, they, they talk a lot about doing your duty and there, and if you have questions about like, okay, well, what is my duty? What are my moral duties? They say all the moral duties are of justice are derivable from understanding the natural basic relationships that you have in life. So uh, stoicism really prioritizes filial piety, which means obeying your parents and showing them respect kind of thing. Not that your parents are always right. They can be wrong too. Um, but that some kind of respect for the parents is appropriate. Um, friendship, uh, about mutual care and concern for each other, for each other's sake. Um, the friend that delights in their friend doing well, this kind of thing. Um, health of the body and the mind being derivative of naturalistic systems, too. There's a lot of stuff like that. Um, some of them are, in, are invoked for things like the appropriateness of uh, rules by uh, rule of society by monarchs um, and that kind of stuff or like the mandates of heaven kind of idea for where authority comes from um, or say like the hierarchical social vision of Confucianism those are all kind of justified on naturalistic grounds um, if it's natural that's a template for what's ideal um, and that's really challenged by Mill and by a lot of modern ethics that just because something is natural doesn't mean it's good. 
just because something is artificial doesn't mean it's bad. Um, maybe we can Im improve on some things. Um, certainly evolution uh, sort of changes the game a little bit in a lot of our thinking about ethics, whether you're religious or not. It's, it doesn't even matter. Um, because we're sort of under evolution, we're like, um, you know, nature doesn't always select for what's ideal. There isn't really an order to things. It's kind of just the chaos of what ends up getting a survival advantage. So that nature sort of serves as some sort of moral authority really starts to get challenged there um, in a way that it wasn't before. But I, there's plenty of philosophers throughout history, even when naturalistic systems are popular, that are skeptical about it, going all the way back to ancient Greece. So, yeah. Um, does that make sense? Yep, yeah, cool, awesome. Um, looks like no other questions popping up here, so we'll keep going. So, um, consequentialism, by the way, thanks for asking all the questions, Alejandro. You've been putting a lot of input in, and I just want to say thank you for that. And anyone else, like, your input really makes this class better. Um, so don't don't be shy. Don't, don't skimp on it. Um, don't worry about derailing me or something like that. Um, the more feedback I get from students, usually the better quality my lectures are, at least in my opinion. Okay, so consequentialism is saying um, right and wrong depends entirely on just what's good and bad and making good happen and avoiding bad things. Um, so utilitarianism is a type of consequentialism because the, uh, the consequences that utilitarianism is highlighting here is utility. So what makes different consequentialist moral theories different from each other is what sort of consequences they consider to be morally significant consequences. And for the utilitarian, it's utility. And what is utility? Is the next natural question here. If um, the consequences that matter are this utility phenomenon, what is that? Well, when Bentham's talking about this for his theory, before Mill gets his hands on it, um, he's really thinking about this, again, kind of as part of the scientific revolution that's happening at his time. He's really thinking about them as uh, an empirical phenomenon. Utility is something we can observe and sort of measure. Um, we can detect it. And so he cashes out utility in terms of feelings of pain and pleasure. And not just restricted to physical feelings, but emotional, mental anguish or... Uh, satisfaction are also on the table here. But they're feelings. Um, when something happens in your external environment, um, that can affect you in some way. So, you know, my finger gets cut off, I feel pain. Like there's a connection between what's happening in the circumstances and my feelings. Uh, or I witness um, some person abusing another person. Um, I can detect that there's suffering going on there. I might be even I might even suffer as a result of that if I feel empathy towards what's going on, uh, or maybe disgust at the injustice of what's taking place, or something like that. So, our external circumstances and the actions that people perform affect us and and affect ourselves too. As as Buddhism is always fond of pointing out, when you act outwardly in your behavior, you also end up affecting yourself too. And Mill definitely thinks that. Um, you are one of the principal people who is going to bear the consequences of your own actions. Uh, other people will too, but you also are, you're definitely impacted pretty heavily by the choices you make. Um, so what happens to you also definitely matters here. Um, but utility for Bentham is really a, um, an experiential sort of happening. It's a kind of pain or pleasure. Um, this led a lot of people to criticize Bentham's utilitarianism as really just a, a fancy, gussied up version of hedonism. And um, Mill is very familiar with these complaints. I don't know if any of you have been taking a look at the, the selections from the primary source uh, for Mill here, uh, Mill's utilitarianism that I made available on Canvas. Um, but right from the get-go, Mill's like, all you haters out there, I got some things to say. Like, he knows there's a lot of resistance to utilitarianism, especially because it's kind of a newfangled idea. It's not been around for a long time. Like, we have, a, we've absorbed through our culture a lot of utilitarian moral intuitions. But things weren't always like that. I mean, utilitarianism didn't have 
sort of the integration in our culture that it has today. Um, so Mill's really cognizant of all the complaints and concerns that people have about this new, you know, secular ethic of, of utilitarianism, um, new kid on the block sort of thing. And this hedonism concern, he really takes to heart, I think. Um, the kind of, the basic objection goes like, there's more to life than pain and pleasure. And there's more to human beings in terms of moral value and meaning than just us as pain pleasure machines. Like there, there's a lot of other things that matter and maybe matter more. So utilitarianism gets looked at as sort of reducing all the things we care about to just brute feelings about stuff. And that's not plausible. That reduction loses something in translation. It doesn't capture all the meaning that these things have for us. Th think about values like, uh, these are some of the favorites I, I like to talk about. Things like a value on freedom, or maybe your um, close relationships with friends and family members. I mean, these aren't things that um, we value because of, not exclusively, because of how they make us feel. It's like I wake up in the morning and I'm like, oh yeah, oh, feeling that freedom. Ooh, oh, that's so good pleasure. Yeah. You know, like, if I, if I tried to take my value on freedom as I experience it and just boil it down to pain and pleasure, it's not going to be hard for someone to make a proposal to me that says, hey, um, so why don't you become my slave and I'll do all this sort of stuff for you. You'll enjoy this kind of lifestyle. You're not going to have any freedom. You don't get to make any choices about your life. It's completely taken away. Um, but you are going to get all this other cool stuff. It's not going to take much to outweigh the pleasure or the possible pain that I get from being free or unfree. Um, so that might raise some red flags. Um, if we don't make that trade, if we don't agree to that, then there's something more going on for where the moral weight of this kind of value is coming from other than what Bentham's theory is describing. So this kind of goes back to my model of moral landscape, moral theory as a map trying to capture that, right? So people are like, Bentham's map just doesn't seem to be matching up to how we care about these moral phenomena, like what our estimation is of their merit, of their worth. Um, so Mill takes that really to heart, and he's going to kind of update utilitarianism in light of these considerations. So if the concern is Bentham's version of utilitarianism is sort of reducing everything we care about to a really narrow type of value, pain and pleasure, that's it. Mill's like, yeah, that's a problem. But there's so many cool things about the utilitarian theory that I think we shouldn't just toss the whole thing in the trash because of that problem. Maybe if I retool it a little bit, we can make it not so reductive, not so restrictive, that it can really be casting this wide net that captures everything that we care about um, while using the same basic model of the utilitarian calculus for decision making that that um, Bentham had in place, uh, with again some adjustments there. Um, so that that's kind of Mill's thinking. So what he what he's going to end up doing, and this is actually one of the trickiest things about the lecture that I, I have to try to explain for you, is um, how Mill's conception of utility starts to change, and it and it's not it, it's starting to drift a little bit further away from pain and pleasure, although. If you have taken a look at the primary source reading, you know Mill talks almost exclusively in terms of pain and pleasure. But he's starting to like play with those words in a way where it's like, are we really talking about the same thing anymore? And that's why a lot of contemporary utilitarians and con just contemporary philosophers, period, kind of read into Mill that he's not concerned so much as about these empirical experiences of pain and pleasure as much as this phenomenon of preference satisfaction. So what do we mean by that? So we might propose here, if utilitarianism is saying the right thing to do is to create the most good consequences, what are the consequences we care about? Utility. Okay, what do we mean by utility? Okay, we mean preference satisfaction. Then what does that mean? It means that it's a good, a good thing has happened if something happens that aligns with what your preferences are. So if you get what you want and you don't get what you don't want, then that's positive utility. 
So if I want a cookie and I get a cookie, woo, positive utility. If I don't want to be a slave and I'm enslaved, well, that's not according with my preferences. So that'd be disutility. But if I don't want to be a slave and I'm not in slavery, then boom, positive utility. My preferences are being satisfied. I'm not getting what I don't want. Um, so positive utility is getting what you want and not getting what you don't want. Disutility, the negative sort of counter uh, version of utility, the negative valence uh, is what we'd say, kind of the negative version value, would be not getting what I want, like having my preferences frustrated in that sense, or getting the things that I don't want to have happen to me happen to me. So that would be disutility under preference satisfaction. And that sort of seems to do a little bit better job here because now if we value freedom, let's say, or the, like personal relationships with people, um, we could have a strong preference for them even if they don't create really big, ex big feelings about um, pain and pleasure. So that's the direction Mill is going to go with it. We'll see a little bit more of how he wants to flesh out the weight of preference satisfaction as we dive into the details about um, the utilitarian calculus, but I want to talk in the I want to talk in kind of the give you the basic model first, and then fill it in with some of the details. Um, another thing, actually, I'm thinking about taking a, a short break here in a second to get some more water. Um, but before I before we do the break here, um, just while we're on the subject here of utility itself, I think. Um, a big thing that's motivating Mill, and one of the things he, I think he really likes about utilitarianism, is that um, it's trying to not prejudge all the different things that we care about. So different people have different ideas of what's good and bad. And if we're thinking about utility either as pain and pleasure or as preference satisfaction, we get this kind of result where we're not really judging whether we think you ought to have that feeling of pain and pleasure or not. It's like it's kind of like the attitude of whatever makes you happy, man. Right. So if if this action is um, painful for me but pleasurable for you, then it's a good thing for you. I just won't do it, right? Because it's painful for me, right? So it wouldn't be good for it to happen to me. But if it makes you happy, then cool. That's positive value. And we don't need to kind of prejudge which of these things we could be caring about that are the appropriate things to care about. Now that will show up, That there's going to be some objectivity about that a little bit later uh, in the theory. But at the outset, I think Mill takes some pride in his theory not prejudging those things, not assuming as a starting point for the theory, well, this stuff's good and that stuff's bad. And there's other people who are like, whoa, 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 whoa. The stuff you're throwing out, that's the stuff I really like, you know? Um, we're going to get to loggerheads really fast in, when we're talking about arguing and justifying a moral theory. If it's just like, these are, I think these things are good, you think these things are bad. Okay, now what, right? So Mill's trying to sidestep a lot of that by just saying, hey, if it works for you, it works for you. Cool. And the theory's going to respect that. I, I think in, in many ways it's, it's fair to say that... Um, Mill wants his moral theory, he's sort of designing his moral theory, you know, again, this map, right, in a way that sort of reflects theoretically back to us just what we care about and how we care about it. That's kind of, I think, part of the metric of success that he's putting for his theory. There's going to be some, some little qualifications for that because, like I said, he is going to have uh, some of a platform here to talk about objectivity for, for the things that we value. Um, but just to give you a little illustration here, um, and this is a, a toy example I'll play with as we go forward in the lecture and talk about the calculus. But let's say, let's just say, this is totally hypothetical. Trust, trust me, I wouldn't do this, and I, this isn't who I am. But let's just say, for the sake, sake of a thought experiment, that I, uh, I love torturing people. So I'm thinking about like kidnapping my students and torturing them in my basement because um, I get a lot of pleasure out of that. Well, it's going to cause you pain. Right, if I do that. But I'll get pleasure out of it. Should I do it under utilitarianism? Is that okay or not okay? Well, utilitarianism is probably going to say it's bad. 
Um, and I'll talk about all the reasons why in a second. But the weird thing about it, and the thing that some people find really disturbing about utilitarianism, is that it counts the pleasure that me, the sadist, would take in torturing you as something morally relevant. Like, it has weight in the utilitarian calculus. It counts as a positive. The, the sadistic pleasure that I would get if I did that would count as a positive. And I think a lot of people would want to maybe say, uh, sadistic pleasure is not something we need to be holding in balance in trying to figure out what's the right thing to do. That's an illegitimate value right out of the gates. It shouldn't be counted for anything. It doesn't, it isn't a positive thing. It's not a good thing to take pleasure in the pain of other people. Um, the utilitarian will say something that might sound a little wacky. It'll be like, well, no, I mean, it's pleasure. Hey, if that's how you get your kicks, man. But the reason you can't do it is because it's also, at the same time, while it's pleasurable for you, it's painful for them. And the pain that's happening to other people is something that detracts from the moral legitimacy of that choice. And there's probably some better choices for how you could be spending your time and energy other than torturing people as a way of enjoying life. Like maybe instead of kidnapping your students and torturing them in your basement, you should throw a pizza party for your students. And it might be like, it might not be as pleasurable as the torture for you, but overall it's going to make more good consequences happen. So that's what you got to do. Right? And that's really the that's the core of utilitarianism is really that law right there. And, I, and it's in my lecture notes here. Um, the main principle of utility is always act in such a way as to maximize utility. That's it. That's the whole theory right there. There's only one moral rule to memorize. Whenever you act, act in such a way that your, the consequences of your choice maximize utility relative to the other options at your disposal. So always do, always take the course of action that creates the most good and the least harm. Is basically that's that's the whole rule. That's the whole theory right there. There's nothing more complicated. That's going to be complicated enough. We'll see why in, in practice. But um, that's the whole idea right there. That's it. Um, so uh, I'm going to take a, a short break here. Uh, if you're in the chat, maybe think about if you got any questions uh, and type them in there. And when we come back, I'll I'll try to answer them. Um, and we'll we'll dive into all the stuff here about the the calculus and the nuts and bolts of the calculus and how it works. Okay, see you in a bit. All right, welcome back. Actually, no time for you watching on YouTube since I paused the recording. But um, back here for kind of part two of today. And by the way, speaking of parts and lectures, um, the way I'm kind of presenting utilitarianism to you is to do the what's of it first, and then we'll talk about the whys later. And we might not get to the whys until Thursday's lecture, um, but that's definitely coming. So definitely right now, as I'm kind of talking through the ideas here, the main goal is to paint a picture of what does it mean to be a utilitarian? What would that look like? Like, what would it... If I agreed with utilitarianism, how would I go about living? Right? How would I make choices? And that's what this next part of the lecture is really focused on. Um, and I think before I was able to do a kind of screen sharing thing for those of you in the chat, and because uh, I'm going to use paint here. Um, there we go. Can those of you in the chat see? Uh, this well white screen right now. I'll start uh, putting some things in here. So I got A, B, and let's put a let's put a C up there. Why not? And uh, put some dots here because there could be some other options. So the the main principle of utility is saying whenever you act. Act in such a way that the consequences of your actions maximize utility overall. And we might add for everyone. Um, and that's kind of important because um, utilitarianism, I, I was alluding to earlier, is a um, egalitarian uh, type of moral system, which means that um, it, it believes that all people are um, sort of equally deserving of... Actually, I'm going to chat here. I'll go away from the whiteboard for a second. Um, 
all people are equally deserving of moral care and concern. Um, no, nobody deserves happiness more than other people. Um, a lot of times egalitarianism, I mean, egalitarianism is everywhere in our modern world. Uh, a lot of our moral intuitions, um, some of our social institutions, governments, things like that, are premised on egalitarian values. Um, that it's not like men are better than women, or r like racial superiority is not a appropriate morally. Like in the in America's history, you have um, non-whites having they get to vote, but their vote counts for like three fifths of a person, like that kind of crap. Egalitarianism is like nope, nope. Each person kind of counts equally. And a lot of times people attack egalitarianism in kind of silly, straw manish sort of ways. Like, it's saying everyone is equal on everything, and that's just not true, duh, people are different. Um, but egalitarianism is not saying that people are the same in every respect. It's saying that they're just the same in terms of their moral worth, or what I like to call moral worth. That's what I, the idea that I like to use that phrase for. Let me talk about that a little bit more. Because this is key to how utilitarianism is going to proceed here um, with its calculus. Um, I actually, I'm, I'm going to do this now. I was going to bring this up with Aristotle, but I think it's, I, it might be good to just do right out of the gates here, right, right with utilitarianism. So um, in my own studies of ethics, it kind of helped me a lot when I, uh, and no one actually gave this to me as something I created for myself, but... Um, I've talked with a lot of people about it, and they're like, oh yeah, that's just, it's like a no-brainer, like it's a square one sort of idea in ethics. But, you know, ethics is all about normativity. How things ought to be, not, not how they are. It's about, it's not, just, it's not making descriptive claims about reality, but it's making evaluative claims. But even within that world of, of normative claims, things that are evaluative, there's a bunch of different categories of kinds of claims we could make. And when we're talking about evaluating people, you know, what kind of value people have, there's a few different types of evaluative claims we can make about people. And they're not, they're logically distinct from each other. And you might want to link them. You Sometimes people link them. Um, but certainly that requires another theoretical move. They, these things are not the same ideas as each other, even if we think one might influence another. So what are those three categories? Well, one category of evaluative judgment could just be about what's good and bad. Um, what are good characteristics of people? What are bad characteristics of people? What are things that would be ideal for people to be like? What are things that are less than ideal for how people could be? That's this kind of category of good and bad. The second category I like to call, I don't have a good name for the first one. Um, sometimes I just call it virtue because it's kind of similar to what Aristotle is going to be doing. Um, the second category, though, I like to call moral status. And a moral status is about a totally different sort of evaluation, one about moral responsibility. Basically, basically, moral status is about your relative guilt or innocence of wrongdoing. So you could have a bad characteristic, but it's not your fault. You're not like guilty of some wrongdoing. For instance, if I have a genetic predisposition for alcoholism, that's a bad thing. That's an unideal trait that I have. Um, but we wouldn't say that I'm like an evil person because I have this genetic thing going on, right? I didn't decide to have those genes. I didn't decide to be born in this body. You know, that's an unfortunate thing that's happening in me. It's bad. But it doesn't mean I'm evil. Um, I, it, it doesn't affect my moral innocence. I am, I'm still innocent here, uh, with respect to that trait. So moral status is about kind of moral culpability, whether I've done good or bad things. I've made moral or immoral choices that I'm responsible for. And then this third category is something I like to call um, moral worth. And that's about a person, you're sort of evaluating whether a person is deserving of care and concern, if they if they are deserving of moral regard. Is Does what happens to them matter for what we ought to do? That's what this category of moral worth is about. If you're an egalitarian, what that means is that you think when it comes to moral worth, everyone is equal. People have value. They deserve care and concern, and they deserve it. They have the same basic deservedness. Now, the needs might be different, right? Um, and so you might 
you know, help some people more than others or something like that, right? And utilitarianism is definitely going to be savvy to those asymmetries. Um, it's not like everyone gets the same amount of help no matter what their circumstances are. But the same, like, think, think about it like um, your right to be happy, <laughs> like to have a happy life. Under egalitarianism, everyone equally deserves that. They equally deserve to be happy. It doesn't matter anything else of what's going on. It doesn't matter whether people are the same with respect to their guilt or innocence. And it doesn't matter whether the same with respect to the, the qualities that they have and whether those are good and bad traits, if they're helpful or useful to society or not. Um, and in that way, utilitarianism is something that I think does fit the contemporary label of progr a progressive ideal. Um, because it's not linking moral worth with those other things. Now, there's plenty of competing perspectives here, right? There are people who want to say that whether you're deserving of care and concern or your, even your right to happiness depends on whether you are morally innocent of wrongdoing or to a certain extent, right? That if you are, if you, if you have done really evil things, then you don't deserve to be happy anymore. Like a notion of retributive justice, like eye for an eye kind of stuff, right? You kill other people, you just lost your right to life. It's totally just for you to be uh, for you to be given the death sentence or something like that. Death penalty. Um, so sometimes people want to link that. Um, sometimes we also link whether people deserve care and concern with just their traits. Like uh, some people might be friendlier uh, or have more easygoing personalities. And other people might not. Um, and that might not be because of things that they have direct control or responsibility for. Um, I still remember uh, I was talking about all this stuff in one of my classes many years ago, and I had a student share a personal anecdotal story with me after the lecture because they're like, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. I was at the supermarket the other day in the parking lot, and this guy just starts cussing me out, and he's like using racial epitaphs at me. Um, and all these, and I was like, I'm gonna go over there and punch this person. And then they kept acting weird because they'd like yell out all this stuff, and then they'd like be like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and kind of turn away. And then they'd turn right back and start yelling, blah, 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 and, and saying all these racist things. And this guy was like, I'm gonna beat this dude's ass. And then he realized that he was like halfway walking over there, and the guy's just like freaking out and saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He realized, he's like, oh, I know what's going on here. This person has Tourette's. And like a really extreme version of Tourette's. It's not that they're like trying to start a fight or something with me. It's not like if Tim Linneman did this to you. Uh, it'd be it's a different sort of thing. Um, so that little context kind of affected um, how he understood what was going on here. So sometimes, um, whether someone is just easy to get along with or not, um, might be a good or bad trait about them. But it might not be something that they have direct control over in terms of this moral responsibility, the second category of moral status. Um, but utilitarianism is saying when you're thinking about in which action you should take and, it's, and you want to take the one that maximizes utility, you're not just thinking about your own utility. You're thinking about everyone's utility on the planet, period. And each person counts equally. Some people do not count for more than others. That's another thing that sometimes people have found counterintuitive about utilitarianism that like if I'm a good utilitarian I gotta treat what happens to my son uh, or my partner or myself as on the same status as what happens to total strangers that I can't like show a prefer an undue preference for what happens to my kid versus other people's kids and for some people that's like oh that doesn't seem right like I think I do have a responsibility first to my family or to my friends that like th those are a higher priority and they ought to be a higher priority whereas uh, other people might be like no you can't do that I mean uh, certainly you can't do it for yourself that's kind of egoism or selfishness that's not appropriate like why do why do you deserve happiness more than other people you don't um, we will actually see a kind of an argument from Mill that really hones that kind of idea um, to a sharp argumentative point. Um, but also, if I'm thinking about my um, my care and concern for those that are close to me, that's kind of just like an extension of myself. 
I mean, everyone's somebody's child. Maybe you've heard people say that kind of idea. It's like, if you have a child and you're concerned about them, like, take that same attitude with everybody. You might be able to empathize with what happens to other people, too. Um, and that there, it isn't like um, little family dynasties should be created at the expense of other people. Um, you shouldn't be sacrificing other people's well-being for the sake of your family. That's what utilitarianism holds to. But definitely some people find that counterintuitive, too. They think there's some maybe special moral regard for these relationships. And that, that can be a matter of debate. Um, but in terms of understanding utilitarianism, everyone counts, and they all count equally in terms of their deserving of care and concern. But, and there's a big but here, even if we all have equal deservedness of happiness and care and concern and that kind of thing, how actions affect us is not always equal. So take, for example, back to my scenario, uh, kidnapping my students and torturing them in my basement. Well, it's my pleasure, your pain. But those things might not be equal just because it's me and you, two people, one, one way, the other way. Whatever pleasure I'm getting out of this sadism probably just doesn't hold a candle to the level of pain and the, the intensity and the quality of the pain that you're experiencing. So all things are not equal here. We both are equally deserving of being happy, but they don't attach, the, the weights are not the same. If it's a small pleasure for a large pain for you, then can't do it. If it's a small pain for me, for a huge pleasure for you, then I gotta do it, right? I mean, that's a really cookie cutter version. We'll see the details here in a second. But maybe you get the basic idea here. Um, take, for example, uh, money. Um, $100 to Bill Gates, it's like, whatever, right? $100 to an adjunct in, uh, philosophy instructor, big deal, big deal. $100 for me, massive compared to Bill Gates. It's not like because we both equally deserve happiness, we should both get $100 or something or split it 50-50 or something. Utilitarianism is going to be sensitive to how, based on people's circumstances, um, actions and behaviors and consequences can land on them in different amounts. But that doesn't mean that somehow some people here are more deserving than others. Everyone's equally deserving. It's just like um, asking me to bear a huge burden for a very marginal gain for you just is not going to create the most good consequences, right? Um, so that's what we have to be sensitive to. So let's take a look at this in detail. Let me do the screen sharing thing again, and I'll, I'll sort of demonstrate this with some drawing. Um, okay, so principle of utility, pretty basic, pretty simple in its sort of formulation. How does it actually look? How do we maximize utility? Well, here's my sort of breakdown of how you be a utilitarian. All right, so first thing you got to do, you got to consider what your options are. So you got to know all the different, I'm faced with a choice, what could I do? What are my options? And let's say here you got option A, option B, option C, there could be some others here too. And by the way, being a perfect utilitarian can't be done, not by human beings, never ever. The standard that tells you that whenever you act, you have to maximize utility, you'll never be able to do it. And one big big reason why you'll never be able to do it is right here in the first step to maximize utility I'd have to be aware of all the different options and I might not be my imagination might be limited if I'm gonna be a good utilitarian then I've got to be able to consider all the different alternative options and a lot of times when we're making decisions about life we might leave out things that really are alternatives. Our, our imagination might be limited. We're not thinking outside the box um, about everything that could be done here. And so there's just some things we're not considering. And so they might be the ones that maximize utility, but we won't know because we're not paying attention to them. So that's one thing of human fallibility that'll keep us from being perfect utilitarians. The next step introduces another notion of fallibility. So uh, let me pull up which thing do I want here. Uh, I think I want this thing, yeah. Um, let's make it a little bigger. All right, so next thing I need to do is anticipate all the sort of consequences that would happen 
if I were to uh, take these different courses of action. And you know, they might be more or less, usually they're pretty complicated. Um, there's a lot of different things that will result if I take this course of action for each of them. Um, in, uh, the reason why this is going to introduce a new amount of fallibility for my ability to be good utilitarian is because I don't have perfect knowledge about how the world works. This requires, to be a good utilitarian at this step, requires me to be really savvy to causal realities. And especially if we're talking about business ethics, that's really hard to know. Um, I remember uh, watching a documentary about the 2008 housing collapse uh, and recession, and there was an economist, uh, I think it was a frontline documentary, there was this economist who, who was being interviewed, and she was like, if someone tells you they understand how the economy works in total, they're lying. No one does. The economy is too complex, uh, too multifaceted for you to understand everything about how it works. It's kind of out of our hands to a certain extent right now. You can be a specialist in a certain part of it. Um, maybe uh, some of you are taking classes on macroeconomics, and there's definitely tools there that help for understanding, getting a handle on things. But to really understand everything and how it works and being able to make accurate predictions about, you know, what if we do this? Uh, what if we do that? Um, what if the Treasury increases the interest rate? Like, what's going to be the effect of that? Is that going to... Um, perpetuate um, some kind of inflation or not. I mean, it's really hard to know what's going to happen. We're not always good at anticipating um, how our actions are going to land on people. And that's the other part of being a good utilitarian, is you're going to need to start measuring these things as positives and negatives to varying degrees. And we'll talk about what variables are going to affect those amounts uh, as we go forward here in the lecture. But Remember, utilitarians are concerned with maximizing utility, and utility is always something that is an effect on a person. So not a market, but how what happens in the market affects people. Is this action something that this person wants to have happen? Are they going to be happy about it? Or are they going to be unhappy about it? To uh, understand that means I need to understand people's preferences, I need to have a lot of empathy and emotional imagination um, to be able to know how other people might feel about things that are different from how I might feel about them. There's some pretty low-hanging fruit, like, I don't want my arm cut off, and I'm pretty sure you don't either. I don't want to be a slave, I'm pretty sure you don't either. Um, baseball bat to the head doesn't sound like fun to me. I'm pretty sure that's true for you. Um, eating cookies? Yeah, that's kind of nice. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe some cookies aren't someone's thing. But generally, um, someone saying hello in a nice, friendly way. That's, you know, something people like, but maybe not everybody. So I need to know about all the different sort of possibilities that are out there, and I need to know in detail how people actually want things to go for them in order to be able to anticipate all these consequences of utility if I take this course of action. So those are, also, those are all things that I don't have perfect information about. There's a lot of ignorance going on. And that will also keep me from being um, an ideal utilitarian. Um, the final step here is, aided by the theory itself and its nuts and bolts, I'm able to kind of sum up these different consequences of these actions and their utility effects into some kind of net utility. And I'm just going to make some arbitrary numbers here. Um, let's say this is negative 9. It really is supposed to have... Uh, a mathematical sort of thing going on. I'll talk a little bit more about the mathematical metaphor here in a second. Um, so let's say, uh, actually, let's just do it. Like that. yeah, that's better. Okay. Um, let's say this is how it turns out. So you'll notice in the way I've just constructed this example, they're all negative numbers, which basically means that all the options I've got are bad. It's kind of like picking your poison here. Um, and I gotta go with the thing that creates the least harm. Uh, maximizing utility doesn't always mean taking a course of action that has net positive utility. And that's one of the main uh, opportunities for misunderstanding with utilitarianism I'd want to clear up right away, which is that utilitarianism is not saying that uh, sort of the ends justify the means in the sense of if your action produces more good than harm, then it's okay. Utilitarianism isn't saying that. What it's saying is that you gotta take the option that maximizes utility. 
And in this, and sometimes life throws these kinds of choices at you. We're like everything sucks. It's going to be bad one way or another. But you still get guidance from the theory about what to do because it tells you to go with the thing that creates the least harm in this situation, option C. Now let's change the situation slightly. And we'll make them all um, positive values here. There we go. If they're all positive values, then even though in maybe option A, more good than harm is happening, that doesn't matter. If option B exists and it's generating all this more utility, then I'm morally obligated to do option B under utilitarianism. I got to do this one because it's the thing that maximizes utility okay, overall for everybody. So that's how the theory is going to work. I consider all my options, anticipate their consequences as best I can, uh, attach utility weights to those consequences based on how people are affected by those things happening, uh, with a number of variables we'll look at it in a second, and then figure out which option has the most net utility, and that's the one I have to go to. That's the, the choice. That's how I determine my choice. Now, like I've been saying, figuring out the choice that really does maximize utility is impossible. It is a theoretical ideal and not something that can be practically attained. But that does not mean utilitarianism is impractical. What it's really doing is setting up this kind of ideal that we could be getting closer to or further away. And even if I, it's not this sort of thing where like you must be this tall to be a moral person or something, right? It's not setting a bar at a certain place. The bar is, there's always a better bar. There's always a room for improvement here under utilitarianism. But the thing that makes it practical is that it gives really clear, clearly defined um, parameters for what moral progress looks like. Like if you want to be a more moral person, if you want to make better decisions, here's what you got to do. This is how it's going to get determined. Um, and there's not... Um, there's not a lot of guessing game about this. We know exactly what problems we're up against. We're up against uh, limited imagination. We're up against uh, incomplete knowledge of how our world works causally. And we're up against incomplete knowledge of each other and how we're going to be affected by things. You don't always know what your preferences are. You don't always know how you'll feel about something happening to you until it really happens, right? Um, you sort of learn that about yourself, about what, what things do you find pleasurable, which things do you find painful. Um, sometimes you have to make some decisions about that, too. You have some ability to affect yourself in that way, too. We'll talk more about that later. But it, it's what's really cool about utilitarianism, and again, I'm not a utilitarian, I'm not a big fan, but the, thing, the merits that the theory really has uh, are that it's very clear about how to be better how to be a more moral person, and the parameters that it's setting up don't require a lot of guessing in terms of how they apply to any particular situation. Um, it doesn't matter what life is throwing at you. It's the same method every time. Um, it's a very robust method for gaining ethical guidance and insight about what to do no matter what circumstances you're facing. So that's what I would mean when I say that the theory is powerful is that it, um, it, has, it has this ability to apply into any set of circumstances. Oh no, connection lock. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, my, my internet just spazzed. Um, I think it's working, though. So like I was saying, um, <laughs> um, do you guys know each other? Are you in like a cohort? Oh, okay, okay, okay. My other uh, business ethics class on campus, everyone knows each other, so I was just kind of wondering. Um, so I was saying uh, utilitarianism is very, very powerful because it, it just it can work on any set of circumstances. So think about other moral theories, uh, especially like maybe religious moral theories are, are maybe a good touchstone, although plenty of secular ones would work fine too. Um, a lot of theories are sort of like, uh, well, these are these are important values or principles. But then you might be like, okay, how do I, how does that, what is that telling me to do in this situation or in this situation? And it might not be clear. You have to kind of add a lot to the moral theory to make it give you an answer about what to do, to like connect the dots between 
the values and the principles and particular courses of action. Man, utilitarianism does not have that problem. Uh, it is always very straightforward. Everything's up front. You know everything that it would be affecting. And it would be like, well, if the circumstances was tweaked this way, here would be the result. But really, the hardest part in terms of ambiguity around utilitarianism as a, as a theory are going to be with the variables that we're going to look at here. So if you're following along with my lecture, lecture notes, uh, um, at, on the second page, um, I talk about, I have a bullet point that says, distinction from Bentham's utilitarianism, higher pleasures. Bentham only recognized quantity. Mill attempts to make room for quality. Um, those are the variables. The variables of quantity and quality are the things that are the nuts and bolts of the utilitarian calculus. The variables that are going to affect amounts of utility, how people are affected by these consequences, uh, for better or worse. Um, and there, like I said, there, there's an intention here that, there, that this is all going to be measurable in some kind of mathematical way. And in fact, people have attempted to do this, and not without some success. Um, have any of you in the chat, um, you're in like accounting program, business programs, um, have you studied any game theoretic modeling for markets? Ever done any of that? Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, this is a, kind of a sector of economics uh, in the 20th century that's really kind of taken off. And um, it basically owes everything that it's got to utilitarianism. Now, under a lot of game theoretic modeling, the assumption is that people in market scenarios are going to act, um, they're going to make choices based on what would maximize their own utility, not maximizing utility overall, but just what would maximize their own utility, and sort of anticipating how our price is going to rise and fall and stuff under different circumstances. Uh, based on the people that are in the market and what they care about. And people have attempted to take this out of the realm of theory and actually model real-life cases with it and real-life people about their preferences. You might be like, how do you empirically quantify preferences? But there are actually some pretty interesting techniques. I'm not a super expert on this stuff, but I, I know just enough to be dangerous. Um, I know that there are techniques for how you can do surveys of people and get a really good picture of what makes them tick. And in fact, uh, oh, you know what? Um, you might know about this from the news. You know about the Cambridge Analytica stuff? The data mining that they were doing with Facebook? Um, they were using those game theor theoretical model and techniques in order to sort of put a number on how likely would a person be moved or persuaded by a certain type of political argument or political story or something like this. Like, are you responsive to this, that, or the other thing? Um, and really, I, I don't know if you uh, followed the story deep enough to see the kinds of information that they were tracking or the profiles that they are creating on people, but they were about really subjective stuff. Um, and it's kind of scary how, how well we can model some of these things. Now, the ultimate um, accuracy of all this kind of game theoretic modeling, hard to tell. But at least as a tool where the dream of a mathematical modeling for all this is maybe not completely off the rails. Um, but let's, let's talk about these variables of quantity and quality. And again, I can't tell you what is one unit of this stuff, but we can definitely have a clear idea of what are the variables that make something more or less here. And that, that's really the important thing. Um, we're going to make, when, when it comes to trying to maximize utility, some things will, there are some facts that we'll be able to use and really sink our teeth into in terms of weighing options. Um, but even when we're not in those situations, we can intuitively get this stuff pretty good. Like when you're reading a room and trying to make a decision about what to do. Like when I've got, um, I love board games, when I have my friends over to play board games, I'm like, what kind of board game would make for the best time for everyone who's here? Based on what I know about them, their personalities, that kind of thing. In that moment, I'm doing a little utilitarian calculus in my head. Even if I'm not pulling out the abacus and, you know, interviewing people with surveys and stuff like that, I'm still using the same principles to reason with. Um, and that might be...
good enough, get us in the ballpark, or make a better choice than if I don't think reflectively on how will people be affected by this choice. Um, so that's all that's going on here. So let's talk through these variables. Um, Bentham, again, is the one who's really emphasizing quantity. And, and that's because he's really motivated by this kind of scientific revolution stuff. He wants something that we can empirically observe, um, it's a real phenomenon that has parameters to it and that we can mathematically model. Um, so things things that can be quantified. And he's thinking really, again, just about pain and pleasure as a type of experience people have. So he's thinking about pain and pleasure in terms of intensity. How intense is the feeling of pain and pleasure? There's a difference between... Um, uh, a glass of uh, nice red wine um, and shooting up some heroin like those are just not in the same ballpark in terms of the intensity of their pleasure um, there's a pretty big difference between um, someone saying you suck from across the the um, parking lot and hurting my feelings and uh, what goes on with like deep emotional abuse in a domestic violence scenario like the intensity of that emotional suffering is not on the same level. So intensity of the feelings is something that can be more or less. Intensity of the pleasure or pain. Uh, duration is another variable. Uh, if it lasts longer or lasts shorter, it'll be a different amount of pleasure and pain. This stuff is all pretty like obvious, right? Um, but, but that kind of gives you an idea of, of what the utilitarian hopes for in terms of doing a kind of calculus here. So we've got intensity, um, let's see if I can remember them all off the top of my head. I'm not looking at my notes right now. Intensity, duration, um, uh, oh, what's that? Um, extent, number of people that are affected. So that's also something we can start counting. Um, the uh, um, proximity, how far in the future is that um, pain or pleasure going to happen if I take this course of action now? And actually, Bentham thinks... Um, and Mill kind of agrees. Actions that have consequences that are way off in the future don't have as much utility weight as the ones that happen immediately. And that might sound like a bias to you, because there's certainly some ways in which that exerts itself psychologically on us that we're like, we don't think about the long-term consequences. I'm not thinking of dying of cancer when I'm smoking a cigarette, right? Um, when I don't want to go to the doctor right now with a little toothache, I'm not thinking about the massive toothache I'm going to have you know, three months from now if I don't have it fixed. Um, but one of the reasons why this might be rational is that if something is way off in the future, there's more opportunity for something to be done about it. And that it might actually sound a little bit more like the next variable here, which actually, I can't remember what word he uses. What is it? Um, oh, right. Yeah, certainty. Um, how probable is this consequence going to be if I take this course of action? Because very few things are total guarantees. Now, if I shoot up heroin, I know it's going to happen. I mean, there's going to be pleasure. It's, it's about as certain as things get. Um, if you hit me in the head with a baseball bat, pretty certain what's going to be the consequence of that. It's going to be some pain. There might be some other things I'm not sure about, like just how bad the pain will be, like how big of an injury. Um, but that's where that's what certainty is for. The more certain something a consequence is, the higher weight it has in the calculus. The less certain it is, the less weight it has in the calculus. Um, a common example for game theoretic modeling is like um, playing the lottery. What's your expected return? Is a way you can kind of quantify um, certainty along with some other kind of value to a consequence, right? You can integrate those two variables together. Um, let's see, what do we got? Um, intensity, duration, extent, proximity, certainty, and then purity and fecundity. And these are two kind of fun ones. Um, purity is a matter, uh, when, when Bentham is saying purity is a factor, what he has in mind is that we would prefer one um, big pleasure versus a bunch of tiny pleasures that add up to the same amount. And I would prefer a bunch of tiny pains rather than one big massive pain. Right? I'd rather kind of dole it out a little bit in smaller amounts. 
Um, so that's another preference that sort of affects the calculus. That one's a lot harder to quantify. Um, and also kind of uh, is an inkling of where Mill is going to go with this, with more of a focus on preferences than on these feelings of pain and pleasure themselves. Um, and then uh, fecundity is another interesting, fun one. Um, fecundity might also be a variable that could get wrapped into some of these other ones, but um, fecundity is saying is, is a variable about how feeling certain pains or pleasures might open the door for other pains and pleasures to be possible. That's fecundity. So, like maybe studying philosophy is a little painful right now, um, but if you keep doing it, then you can unlock these joys and pleasures of philosophy that you might not otherwise be able to experience. Um, this is what Aristotle says about philosophy. We'll talk about it when we get to Aristotle later. But he's like, man, once you taste the good shit, you don't go back. And philosophy is the good shit. Um, there's a, a special pleasure that comes from uh, per reflection and thinking about truth and debate and wisdom and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I have to say, just personally, I'm like, I kind of think he's right. I mean, in just my personal experience, if that counts for anything, I'm like, there, there is a way in which philosophy doesn't become something painful, even with all the uncertainty, even with all the disagreement and potential for conflict. Um, man, when you can do that cooperative truth-seeking thing with some other people, it can be a blast. And just totally, like, euphoric. But anyway... And so maybe pain opens up some pleasure. Or to go back to the heroin thing, um, a lot of pleasure, but sets you up for a bunch of pains, right? And, it, and they're, they're kind of linked with each other. Um, it might be the pain, the pleasure itself, which leads to the pain, like withdrawal symptoms and stuff like that. So that's, that's what Bentham has in mind with fecundity. Um, and Mill mostly buys into all of this. He thinks... All these variables of quantity count. They affect the calculus. But he's really worried that there's a big thing that's been left out, and that's this idea of quality. And quality is really hard to describe. I mean, this is probably the hardest part of Mill. Uh, there's some stuff coming up that's a little harder, too. We'll talk about it on Thursday. But um, the quality thing is, is pretty difficult. And this is where a lot of misunderstanding happens with utilitarianism and with Mill. So Mill, Mill wants to inject into Bentham's version of the calculus a new variable, a different variable. And it's going to be a variable that deals with the objections of hedonism that I was talking about earlier. Like Mill, Mill knows where the detractors of utilitarianism are kind of coming from, and he's, he's sympathetic with them. He's like, yeah, there is more to life than just pain and pleasure. Um, even though he uses that language in the book, um, you, you see that he's starting to like think about it in a, in a little different way than Bentham is. Um, not such a brute causal feeling sort of thing. Um, I used the example earlier of freedom um, and the loving, caring human relationships. That these have kind of a value that goes beyond their quantity of pain and pleasure. But the way that Mill goes about this, and like I said, modern utilitarians have sort of shifted this a little bit to language that maybe is a little clearer. Um, with talk of preference satisfaction, but Mill's still using Bentham's language, but talking about the quality of a pain or a pleasure. And I'll kind of give it to you in the abstract first. Mill's thinking that there are certain values, like say freedom, that have a small quantity of feeling that's connected with them. But that the pleasure of freedom, for instance, even in a small amount, a qu small quantity, huge quality, and a small amount of a high quality pleasure can maybe outweigh a large amount of a low quality pleasure. So high quantity, low quality might be able to get outweighed by a very small quantity of a high quality pleasure. And let me give you kind of an example that might be a little intuitive to sort of get inside Mill's head here. Think about, um, maybe you've had this experience of like a 15 minute conversation with someone that you're really close with. And it's not just a like, hey, how's it going kind of conversation, but it's like deep connection. Like, 
you know each other really well, so you just you know, go right into it. And it might not last very long. It might just be like a little kind of check-in, um, but it's really deep and very intimate. And that can like totally change your day, right? I mean, it can just like, like just revitalizes everything. So, so meaning might mean a lot to you. It might even be just like a text message that someone sends to you. It's just like it has a lot of meaning to you. Um, versus like an entire day of binge watching Netflix or something. It's like, yeah, there's pleasure in that, but it's like, it's quality and it's meaning. It's just like, just doesn't kind of measure up. Right? It doesn't, it doesn't have the uh, same gravity or weight to it. I'm speaking in a very loose way right now about it. Mill's going to give us some help on how to pin down quality a little bit more. But, but Mill, Mill thinks um, this seems to be a reflection of how we value things. Remember, I mentioned earlier in the lecture that. Mill, I think, is kind of trying to design a moral theory that just sort of reflects back to us how we value things. And he's like, if we don't just if we don't value things just based on these feelings of pain and pleasure, how can I build that into the calculus? How can I get that reflected in the utilitarian model? And quality is his answer. He wants to do it with quality. Um, quality is a way to kind of uh, get the calculus to make the right predictions again. Like how to fix it. I, I sometimes like to describe it as like this mysterious property X of, of quality um, that fixes these problems about hedonism that um, and also is going to inject a kind of objectivity into utilitarianism that up until this point really hasn't had so far. Um, do you remember how up to this point we've been sort of talking about how utility is kind of a like whatever makes you happy sort of thing, right? Different people can value different things. Utilitarianism doesn't care. It's like, oh, how does it affect you? And how does it affect you? And how does it affect you? Right? And that's all we need to know um, to building out the calculus and figuring out which thing will create the most good. But with quality, Mill's going to say quality is not so subjective, that it is on a more objective, universal metric. Um, that some of these pleasures are just better than others, and some of these pains are more serious than others, and it's something that we can be, we can get wrong. We can be ignorant about these things. Um, maybe it's kind of like the "don't knock it till you tried it" kind of um, sentiment of like, you ever had this experience that you've gotten older that you've been like, um, when I was younger, I valued these things. I thought that they were pretty awesome, but I didn't really know what I was talking about. Like then I had some other experiences, and I was like, "Oh, this is, oof, that's a, this is really important." Once you've experienced this other kind of value or or even pleasure or something, then you're like, "That's the good shit." Like I was kind of talking about earlier with philosophy. It's like once once you get an, an encounter with it, then you're like. Whoa, okay, yeah, I had a wrong estimation of this stuff in the past. So it does seem, it seems like the quality of values is something that we can learn about, that we can grow in our understanding of. And Mill is sort of reflecting that here with, with putting some objectivity to that. Um, I'm coming up on two hours here, so I'm kind of getting a little sensitive for cu uh, cutting this video lecture off before opening up another big can of worms. But we definitely have some more things to talk about with quality and what this move means for Mill uh, and for utilitarianism, as it changes the game, because it kind of changes the game a little bit. Um, and and what, is, what sort of are the things that recommend it? Uh, and I think I can do more to give you um, a backstory about, one, how Mill thinks we're going to figure out what these things are. Like, how do we figure out which pleasures and pains are higher and lower? Um, what court of appeal or accountability is there for that? Um, and then also, um, just kind of like, why why would we want to put that kind of objectivity in there? And some modern utilitarians don't. They, they, they actually remove it. Um, and, and it happens through preference satisfaction. So um, Sometimes when modern utilitarians talk about utility in terms of preference satisfaction, they do retain the idea that um, some of these preferences have like objective, more objective weight than others um, on a kind of universal basis. Uh, but other ones um, have sort of removed that and just opted for 
uh, priority rankings of preferences in an individual person as setting the weights of those things. Um, but there's definitely some reasons for why having some objectivity here might be a good idea for the theory. So we'll, we'll get into some of that stuff um, next time. Um, but maybe to kind of close out this video, I'll ask the chat uh, if, if there have been any kind of questions or anything I can help with clarifying. Aha! Yes, uh, I did talk about the journals, and and I think I think what I talked about at the beginning of the video will um, address the things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Let me know though if it doesn't, of course. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Hong Mei, thank you so much. Um, I don't know why I I always just get distracted with everything I have to say and or that needs to be said. Uh, okay, uh, tonight's code word is going to be unrest it's the title of the new board game expansion i got um, which i'm excited for so yeah unrest is the code word for tonight yeah thank you so much for the reminder and uh anyone who's in the chat in the future i'll probably need that <laughs> i was so good last time i taught an online class but yeah so yeah, it, all the stuff. I mean, I'm used to the stuff I'm talking about here in the in the video tonight um, as being like sometimes a little hard to make sense of or or to make those ideas accessible. So um, I I hope I hope that I explained it well and did a good job lecturing and just cleared everything up and it was perfectly transparent and everything. But um, my guess is there might be some questions out there. So um, let me know if there's anything that I could review here. Could be useful to other people watching this video too. Have a good night. Okay. No questions. No wait. Yes, the the assignment is not up on Canvas yet. My, my sort of uh, procedure here is I get done with the video, I get it started in coding, create the assignment, um, upload the video, and that, that's how it happens. So um, the, they won't be created until I've made the video. Yeah, but it'll be up there pretty soon. Can a preference be satisfied with low quality short quantity? Um... Um, yeah, I mean, I can have preferences for pretty trivial things, like um, high fives. Just want a high five. Boom. Satisfied. Or if I have a preference for, um, I don't know, hmm. like, the, like the little pleasures in life kind of thing, like, I love, uh, you know, having having a little mint on my pillow at the hotel or something. I mean, that's probably not going to be a huge quantity or huge quality pleasure, uh, but that could be the, what all the preference is looking for. But really, in terms of the theoretical object of the preference here, the preference might be a way of determining what we're talking about when we're talking about the quantity. So, like... Um, how much weight does that preference have in me is a way of figuring out uh, its relative utility, like how I'll be affected. Um, and like I was just saying, you know, if you if you don't want the objectivity for quality, you could just use the preferences themselves as setting those rankings based on the priority list of your preferences. So which preferences would you rather have satisfied over your other preferences if you had to choose kind of thing? Um, that could be a way of setting a subjective version of quality. And it actually could be used for an objective version of quality, too, with some important theoretical stipulations, which I'll be talking about next time. Um, kind of some idealized scenarios under which I would form preferences um, could also be a way of, of getting a handle on the, uh, the objective version of quality, too. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Cool. 
there will be some follow-up for this next time. Just stay tuned. Okay, well that's looking like it. So we'll um, bring this video to a close. Thanks for watching it, YouTubers. And um, we'll see you around. Good night, everyone. Everyone's gone. <laughs> Bye.